Good evening. Thank you for coming to the lecture tonight. My name is Lynn Baker. I'm the director of the Jazz Studies and Commercial Music Program at the Lamont School of Music, University of Denver. Uh, we have as a special guest with us this week, artist in residence, Mr. Richard Bukas. Richard is a fantastic musician, singer, guitarist, composer, historian, great theory teacher, and fantastic friend. He's going to be talking to us this evening about the music of Hermeto Pascual, and would like for you to welcome to the stage, please, Mr. Richard Bukas. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody, to uh, what is always a real pleasure to do, which is to introduce people to uh, an incredible creative genius, uh, that being Hermeto Pascual. Uh, he is a musician's musician and someone who has impacted generations of musicians in Brazil and throughout the world, wherever he has performed and wherever his music has traveled. Um, to actually begin uh, our, our meeting today, I just want to give you just kind of a layout of what your handouts are and that way you'll kind of get an idea as to how they kind of interrelate. Uh, the first uh, handout is that you have a discography example of examples and uh, we may not get to all of these uh, particular tracks but uh, we'll get to hopefully most of them. Most of them are uh, compositions of Hermeto and some of them are compositions by other composers who have been in his group or are still in his group who have gone on to be band leaders and great composers in their own right. Uh, most significantly the pianist Jovino Santos Nato and the bassist Ichiba de Svar. Uh, and we also I believe have one cut from Andre Marquez who is currently Hermeto's pianist over the last dozen years or so. Um, so that's your discography and it gives you the, the source of where those, uh, those recordings are from. Most of them are available and you shouldn't have much trouble finding them. Uh, the next thing is I have a, a two-page handout, double-sided, that kind of summarizes the formal dimensions of select pieces. So it'll say select formal analyses and phrase structure and this kind of just gives you a map of how the piece is organized uh, in, in terms of its sectional structure and subphrases. And, um, and I think it's kind of helpful to take a look at this because in a lot of cases there's non-symmetrical phrase structures, five bar phrases, nine bar phrases, and uh, it's interesting to see just how natural they are. Just like they're natural in Haydn or Mozart. When you hear a five bar phrase of Mozart, say, my God, that's so natural. So it's really the same with Hermato. The other handout that you have is um, a double-sided sheet um, which discusses his chord symbol notation and his basic harmonic concepts. So um, what I thought I would do is give you just a, a brief introduction about his early life and then go directly to the handout, which is the summary of uh, his chord symbol notation. So I'm going to put, let's see, is this, I'll put this up on the, on the screen. So the thing about uh, Hermeto's notation is it's actually quite, it makes a lot of sense. It may not be that easy to read at first, but when you realize how his harmonies are constructed, you'll see that it really does make quite a bit of sense. Um, the thing about Hermato and his, and his harmonic concept is instead of thinking in terms of the kind of extensions that we build in thirds, one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, it's not quite as linear as that. He thinks more in terms of whole or parts of triads which are stacked on each other. And he calls these different stacks andaris or floors, like the floors of a building. 
And so there are one floor chords, and there are two floor chords, three floors, etc., etc., etc. And each of these floors can contain either the entire triad, alterations of the triad, or just certain parts of the triad. And uh, what results are sounds that sound very complex to the listener, but then when you actually take them apart, they're actually quite simple. So, uh, taking you back to when he was born in 1936 in the state of Alagoas, which is in the north, it's tobacco country, not a whole lot of music going on in Alagoas. And uh, when he was really small, I mean like five years old or something, he used to hang out in his grandfather's uh, workshop. He was, his grandfather was a blacksmith. And so there were shards of metal hanging out all over the place. And what her method would do is he would suspend them by a string and he'd throw rocks at them. And the sounds that would come off of these shards of metal yielded these incredible harmonics. You know what it sounds like when you, when you ring a triangle or when you ring something that's very metallic? Well, in this case, he was throwing stones at these big shards of metal, and the resulting sounds were sounds that really, really affected him very deeply, along with the sounds of nature, birds, all kinds of different animals that that uh, were part of his childhood. And so when he took the small button accordion known as the Oitu Baishu, literally means eight bases. And it's, a, it's an accordion that's about this big, wood paneled, and it's all buttons. And the buttons, you have melodic buttons, and then on the left hand, you have buttons which are just triads. So if you need to arrive at a more complex chord, you have to mix the triads. So what he was doing when he was first learning the Oitu Bajus is he was trying to match the sounds that he heard in his grandfather's workshop. So he was, and the only tool that he had, he didn't have a piano, he never owned a piano ever in his life until much, much later in his career. And so um, this, is, this was his, his exploration, trying to find those sounds that he heard as a child and trying to unearth them from this Oitu Bashus. Um, so Hermeto, uh, being an albino, uh, his sight was very poor. And so it was very difficult for him to learn how to read music. It was very difficult for him to get a teacher to teach him how to read and, and write music. Uh, so he had to rely on his own initiative to, to do that. And so right around 1950 or so, he decided uh, to move to Caruaru, which is still in the northeast of Brazil. And he became part of the little ensemble there. And these little ensembles, which play for radio stations in cities and villages, are called regional. It's, it looks like regional but they're, they're, they're called Hejonal, which is like literally like you're kind of like the house band for a radio station. And so if a singer comes through town, you're the band that plays for them. So he moved through Karuaru, and then not too long after that, and, and, and what happened was that it, there, were, there weren't very many instruments there, no, no orchestral instruments, no wind instruments, nothing really, just, just very basic stuff. But when he went to Recife, uh, in the state of Pernambuco, that's where he came into contact with orchestral instruments. And he would just go to these orchestra rehearsals and just sit and listen to these instruments. And that's how he got turned on to, to all of these different instruments for the first time in his life. 